What's up my fabrication family? The way that you wire a car audio system can absolutely make or break the performance of that system and have a profound effect on the reliability of the system. Now in the Jeep that I'm working on right now, I'm gonna be installing two amplifiers, six speakers, and a digital signal processor. I'm going to actually be getting the signal from the system from the stock radio. What steps need to be done to power the amplifiers and speakers, and how do I install this wiring so that this system is rock solid for years to come? Let's find out. What's up guys, welcome to Car Audio Fabrication. On this channel, I do all sorts of tutorial videos and lessons focused on car audio and build videos just like this one, walking through the whole build step by step. So if you're new here, consider subscribing. Let's head on over to the Jeep. Before we get started wiring the Jeep, the first thing we're gonna wanna do, and this is something you'd wanna do on any vehicle, is disconnect the negative battery terminal. This basically breaks the circuit for the whole vehicle, so now I don't have to be concerned if I accidentally have a power wire touch ground. Once again, it's time for me to pull the interior. Now if you remember, I had to do this for the sound ending phase as well, and ideally you would do all your wiring while everything was out of the vehicle. But since installs always take me a while to complete, I have to pull the interior once again, but that's okay, I do it for you guys. For this project, for the time being, I'm actually going to be using the factory signal from the factory radio. In order to get that signal, I need to access the wiring that's back behind the radio. How you actually remove the radio is of course going to change from vehicle to vehicle, but a cool little trick you can do is just try to find the seams between the different pieces to get an idea of how everything comes apart. Also, most vehicle manufacturers design the dash so that little pieces like this will hide a mounting fastener that we need to remove. For the Jeep, there's also a hidden bolt under the random crap holding tray. With all the fasteners removed, now I can remove the radio trim bezel. With that out of the way, the radio comes out next. With the radio pulled out of the way, I identify the speaker wires and start stripping a small amount of insulation off of them. Before I connect to this wire, I want to make sure that I have a full range audio signal. Since this radio only has four channels of output, and I've already noticed in one of the previous videos that there's a passive crossover on each of the tweeters, I have a pretty good feeling that everything at the radio is going to be completely full range. So I turn on the radio and start playing pink noise, and my assumptions were correct. You can see that we have a full range signal from 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz. Now you can also see that that signal is not completely flat, but no worries, that's what we'll be taking care of later with our equalizer inside of the DSP. I talk more about identifying a full range signal in one of the previous videos of this video series. I'll link it up at the top of the screen. We'll talk more about tapping into the radio later, but for now, let's switch over to running the power wire. Now luckily on the Jeep, there's a nice rubber grommet location that we can go through really easily with our main power wire. But on many vehicles, there isn't an easy location, and you might have to drill a hole, so the only advice I'd give you guys is make sure that you add an aftermarket grommet. You can use something like this that I'm putting up on screen right now, and I'll leave you guys a link of some helpful different tools and materials down in the video description. So let's talk power wire management. When I'm running a power wire through an engine bay, I'm always extremely careful to make sure that the wire isn't close to anything that moves. I'm also super careful to make sure that I don't run the wire next to anything that gets really hot, like an exhaust manifold. Now whenever I make a wire connection inside something that has a set screw, I like to use these things called wire ferrules. These are nice because they prevent the wire from having any extra frays hanging out the sides. I insert the wire into the fuse block and as I tighten down the set screw, it crimps that ferrule onto the wire. I then give her a little pull test just to make sure that everything's good and tight. Now something else I like to do to the main power wire in the engine compartment is just give it an extra layer of protection, so in this case I'm adding this plastic wire loom. With the loom completely wrapped around the wire, I can now secure it within the engine bay using zip ties. Once the loom is completely installed, it should look something like this. Now I need to make the connection from the battery positive post to the fuse block. The Rockford Fosgate amp wiring kit actually came with the ring terminal already crimped onto one end, so all I had to do was add the ferrule to the other. To protect this short strand of wire, I'm once again using wire loom, and to secure the wire loom to the wire, I'm using exterior Tessa tape. 
This special tape can handle the high temperatures of the engine compartment, and it's actually what a lot of the OEMs use in order to make their wire bundles. Once this wire is prepared, I install it by connecting it to the positive battery post, and then once again connecting inside the fuse holder. It's important to remember that this strand of wire should be as short as possible because it's not protected by a fuse, and we'll also want to make sure that we secure it to some of the factory wiring in the case that it does become disconnected that it can't reach ground. We'll hold off on installing the fuse until we're done running the rest of the wiring. Let's get back inside the vehicle. I'm going to be running the power wire down the driver's side of the vehicle and all the signal wires and speaker wires will be on the passenger side. Keep in mind that there's a factory piece of plastic that goes over all these wires, so you'll want to consider that when you're installing the wiring so that it's not in the way of any of the mounting points. Over at the amplifier rack, I consider what I want my layout to be like for the different wiring components. I'm going to keep the main power distribution on this side and the ground distribution on the opposite side. Next up, I'm going to start running all of the different speaker wires. Since all the speakers are going to be ran using a 4-channel amplifier, I'm going to upgrade all the wiring to this 12-gauge speaker wire. The front speakers that I'm installing are actually component speakers, and they're these Rockford Fosgate T2s. Since these are component speakers, it requires that I install these passive crossovers somewhere within the vehicle. I'll be installing both of the crossovers in this location underneath the passenger seat, so I need to run all the speaker wires from the amplifier to that location, and then from there to each of the individual speakers. As a side note, be sure to watch out for these damn booby traps that the car manufacturers like to leave for us. As I run each wire, I'll actually tag each end of it by just using a piece of tape and a sharpie. This helps so that when I go to actually attach the wires to the crossovers, I know exactly what speaker they're for. In the meantime, I also remove the rear sound bar that holds the two rear 6.5 inch speakers. I'm going to be doing a full sound treatment process on this sound bar where I make it really good for bass, so be sure to check back for that video. Now these rear speakers don't need to go to the crossovers, they're going to go directly to the amplifier, so I'm running the speaker wire down the B pillar back to the amps. Once all the speaker wires are ran throughout the vehicle, it's time to start bundling everything. Bundling everything together makes it so that the wires are easier to manage and it just keeps everything nice and clean. Much like the power wire, I lay all the speaker wires and run them through a path back to the amps. Notice that I also cut the wires intentionally longer than I needed to, just so that I make sure I have enough wire. To get the signal from the factory radio back to my rear digital signal processor, I'm going to be using this 9 conductor cable. I strip the 9 conductor cable, and then I strip an open section into the wire harness that I need to tap into. Next, I use a pointed tool like a wire probe to actually poke a hole between the strands that I've exposed. I then take the wire that I'm adding and push it through that hole and twist it around the exposed section. This makes for a much better bond between the wires once I solder it. With the interior of the vehicle protected with a red mat down below, I can now solder this joint. I of course repeat this for each of the speaker signal outputs, and once everything's done, I again bundle everything up using some Tessa tape. Once complete, I have a nice clean wire bundle ready to be attached to the radio. The 9 conductor signal cable was then run alongside the speaker wires to the back of the vehicle, and in the meantime I also connected the crossovers. Sometimes there's spots where all the wiring needs to be firmly held in position so that it doesn't interfere with the fitment of a panel, and for that I can use these cool pieces of tape from Tessa. Links to all of these different special products is available down in the video description. Now that the speaker wires and signal cable along with the power cable are all wired to the back of the vehicle, I can make all of my connections to the amplifier and DSP. I'm going to pause the video real quick here so I can explain everything to you guys. All the way to the left is my main power distribution. This powers the two different amplifiers. Teed off of that is a separate little fuse block and I'm using that for the digital signal processor. Over to the right side, you can see that I've made my ground and I also have a ground distribution block. The ground distribution block has a ground for each of my amplifiers along with the digital signal processor. Finally, the light blue wire is actually my signal turn on lead for the amplifiers. And this DSP is really cool where it has a signal sense where it knows when the speakers are playing music and it will then turn on and activate the amplifiers. Once I completed making all of my connections, all that was left to do was to power up the system for the first time. Sure enough, everything powered up just as planned. A special thanks goes out to Rockford Fosgate and Audio Control for sending me the different products that I'm installing in this Jeep. 
Also, be sure to subscribe because in the next few videos I'll be sound treating the rear sound bar to improve audio performance for the rear speakers. I'll also be making a custom speaker ring and showing a cool way of making easy to disconnect speaker harnesses. A special thanks goes out to Eddie, Brian, Ali, Pedro, Finchy, EJ, Emmanuel, Rory, Truman, and Jerry along with the rest of the Patreon support team. Thank you again to everyone for watching.